Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Ted Harris. I am the Executive Vice President of the Pennsylvania Petroleum Association. Our association, the PPA, is one of the, the numerous partners that make up the Eastern Energy Expo. Uh, on, behalf of, on behalf of all of our, our um, various association partners, I'd like to welcome you this morning to the Eastern Energy Expo On Demand 2020. This event's gonna be taking place the entire month of August. We're, uh, we're about halfway through here. Um, this event includes daily seminars, business seminars that happen at 10 a.m. This is our eighth seminar of the month. Uh, and we also have live technical sessions that take place throughout the month. There's also pre-recorded technical sessions available. All this is happening within the Eastern Energy Expo on-demand platform. Um, so I encourage you, if you haven't already, log into that platform, utilize that platform. You'll be able to see upcoming seminars that are taking place. You'll be able to see the, all the previous ones that happened already. Um, you'll be able to see information such, such as the 120 plus exhibitors that we have, uh, be able to interact with those exhibitors. A lot of those exhibitors have show specials or new products that they're showcasing. Uh, all that is in the on-demand platform. So again, I encourage you to utilize that and check that out. I would also like to thank the 20 plus sponsors that we have that supported this event in various levels. Without our sponsors, this would not be able to take place. Obviously our hope this year was to have an in-person event. Um, but again, you know, the, the circumstances obviously did not allow that. And I really would like to thank all of our sponsors who stepped up and uh, continue to support this event in its current format. Before we get started today, a few housekeeping items on my end. Uh, every attendee on the webinar is gonna be on mute. Uh, with that being said, we encourage you to ask questions to our presenters. You can do that by using the question feature and go to webinar. Simply type your question uh, and we and I will moderate it to the presenters throughout the, the, the webinar or at the end of the webinar. If for some reason we don't get to your question, uh, I will absolutely make sure that we connect you with our presenters after the fact to make sure you get an answer or clarification on that. So I encourage you all to ask questions. Um, like I said, this is our eighth, eighth business session of the month so far. And the ones that um, had a lot of questions previously and had a lot of interactions uh, have been the best in my opinion. So I encourage you all to ask a question today or multiple questions and please take advantage of that, that capability. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce our presenters, Tamara Kovacs and Cooper Wilburn with Propane Resources. Collectively, these two presenters have completed business sales of over 400 retail propane valuations for companies all over the country in need of state valuations, sale to a family, family member or third party, bank financing, or just want to know the value of their business. The value, their valuations focus on not just the value of the company, but on strength, the strength and weaknesses of the company and, and keys to build value over the upcoming years. Uh, Cooper and Tamara will be presenting best practices for valuing a propane business. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to them. Great, thank you so much, Ted. First of all, I'd really like to um, thank everyone at the Energy Expo, our Eastern Energy Expo, for inviting us to speak to you guys today. Um, we really do appreciate that. And I also want to thank everyone today for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us to, to participate in this session today. Um, what I'd like to kind of outline for you today on what we're going to be going through is we're going to be talking about what is value and how is it derived? We're also going to be talking about the factors that drive exit multiples and how they impact the value. Uh, we're going to be talking on items that focus on if you're preparing to sell your business or looking to make an acquisition, the things that you ought to be focusing on as well. So I think the first thing we really want to talk about is what is fair market value? Yeah, so uh, just to define fair market value here, um, it's the price that property would sell for on the open market with the following conditions. Uh, prospective buyers and sellers are reasonably knowledgeable about the assets, behaving in their own best interest, free of undue pressure to trade, and given a reasonable time period for completing the transaction. So let's just break it down here real quick. Um, the first part uh, is the price property would pay 
uh, would sell for on the open market. So that's just saying that, you know, if you were to take the, uh, the business out to, you know, the entire world, um, you know, anyone looking to buy, that's what that open market would be. But there are, there are conditions. So the first one is that the buyers and sellers are both reasonably knowledgeable. So, you know, the buyers understand what the propane or heating uh, oil distribution company is, how it works, what assets are required. Uh, next condition would be that uh, they're behaving in their most, uh, best interest. So they're not, you know, buying or selling to spite, you know, another owner or someone else, um, you know, someone else. Uh, lastly, free of undue pressure and given a reasonable time period, you know, the seller or buyer can't be forced to make a decision within 15 or 45 days. You know, they need a reasonable time period, you know, many months to um, understand what the, the uh, you know, business is and uh, do their due diligence. So there's really, um, you know, two ways we can determine value. Uh, first is the asset value. So all that is, is, you know, what those physical assets are worth and, you know, what it would cost to replace those, those assets. Uh, second, which this is really how companies are bought and sold is the earnings value. You know, we look at it as a multiple of EBITDA and we'll go into kind of what, you know, goes into that earnings value. Uh, there's really two components. You have the earnings, which is the EBITDA, and then you have the multiple. Um, and it's kind of, you know, the earnings, the EBITDA parts, you know, really, you know, a mathematical science, right? It's, you know, your net income plus interest taxes, depreciation and amortization. It's a straightforward calculation. The multiple, however, it's, it's more art. And we'll kind of get into these different, um, different items that affect, you know, that multiple. Uh, but just so you guys know, the last couple of years, you know, we've seen multiples range from four to 10. So, you know, anything you can do to get, you know, the higher end of that multiple, the better. So, I mean, if you're to take a company that had, you know, an $800,000 EBITDA, you need to put a four multiple up to it. You know, they're at like a $3.2 million value. Uh, if you put a 10 multiple to it, you have an $8 million value. So you can really see the power of, you know, that multiple and how it can affect the value. Um, real quick, we'll just kind of talk, you know, blue sky, you know, what this is, it's the difference between the, the asset value and the earnings value. You also hear this referred to as goodwill um, or, you know, the intangible, you know, value, intangible assets. Uh, generally, the better companies we see, uh, they have, you know, more blue sky or more goodwill within the company, you know, they're customer lists are worth more, their trade name, different things like that, you know, go into, go into that uh, higher earnings value. So let's talk a little bit, like Cooper said, you know, it's a multiple of earnings and we're going to be talking about these primary drivers of the exit multiple and the things that the top 10 things that we have listed here, there's a lot of other things that will impact the multiple, not just these 10 items, but they may dovetail into here. And we kind of narrowed the, the drivers of the exit multiples to 10 things, being the gallons trends, the market segment, top accounts, you know, customer growth, margins, operational efficiencies, your tank ownership, the quality of your staff and your assets, as well as the safety of the business. Um, so one of the things that we need to think about is it's not just how these impact your multiples, but it's also, you know, how these can impact the earnings value or the earnings of your company too, because all of these things have some kind of impact on your EBITDA. So what we're focused on is not just increasing your multiples, but also increasing that earnings as well, because if you increase both of those at the end, you're going to have a, a much higher uh, value of your company. So what we did before the presentation is we went out and we surveyed uh, resident or retail companies in the industry and asked them to rank in order of importance these top, these 10 items that we had listed. And what we asked them to do was take the top five, you know, rank them in the top five of what they thought was most important to impacting the exit multiples. And what we saw was 53% of the respondents came back and said they thought tank ownership should be in the top five of the most important factors driving exit multiples. 
the next one was margin and profitability trends, and that came in at 39%. Uh, safety, quality of staff, gallons trends, and quality of assets, those all came in pretty much at the same at 24 or 25%. And really all of those, you know, the order we thought was pretty spot on on what we thought should be in the in the top the top five. Um, customer growth came in at 21%. Market segment's probably the one that I would have put much higher than 15% uh, of the respondents did. I probably would have listed that higher. And we're gonna go into more detail as to why we think that should have been higher. 15% uh, of the respondents thought that um, percentage of gallons with the top account should be um, in the top five, and then 12% thought operational efficiencies should be in the top five. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of talk about each one of these in more detail, how it impacts um, that exit multiple, and why, why we believe it's important. So the first one we're going to talk about is tank ownership. And one of the things that we see that most buyers are looking for, and one of the questions, the, the first questions they ask is, what's the percentage of tank ownership? Um, and because they want the company to own the majority of the tanks. And the real question is, you know, it really comes down to control. And it's, you know, if you, the company, own that tank, then you control the gas that goes into the tank because legally you're the only one that can fill that tank. Um, you control what happens to the tank, you control, you know, the, the margins that go through that tank, you control everything about that tank. You also control more of the safety aspects of the tank because you're the only one that can fill that tank. So, if, you know, if you go out there, your driver goes out there and he's anticipating that tank sitting at 25% and all of a sudden, you know, he gets out there and the tank's at 5%. Well, you know, that should be a big red flag for him because he should be saying, why is this tank only at 5% when I thought it was at 25%? Have they added another appliance? You know, is there a leak? You know, what's going on? Well, if the customer owns a tank, they don't have, you know, you don't know if you were the last person that delivered gas or if somebody else did. And so you lose some of that control of, from a safety standpoint. Um, another reason that it's important to have that tank ownership is you know one you have more underlying assets customers typically are stickier and you know they're less likely to call around to another company um, the other thing is is that generally it it's a barrier of entry because if a new company is coming in and doing a startup if you own the tank then they're going to have to make a capital investment to replace that tank whereas if it's a customer owned tank it's much easier to switch to a new supplier um, the other thing that, you know, for companies that are looking to make acquisitions is if it's a high com or customer owned business, then they're really worried about when they make that acquisition, are they going to lose a lot of those, you know, customers, therefore the gallons and the earnings that they've just purchased. And we've seen this, you know, we've, we've actually worked with a, a company that had very low tank ownership and it was in an area that wasn't known for having low tank ownership. And, you know, part of the, the challenge that we ran into was not just the lower multiple that was applied to that business, but there was a lot of buyers that didn't even want to look at the business because of the low tank ownership. So you could be limiting your number of buyers if you don't have high tank ownership. Um, so, like I said, definitely, you know, if you're lower on the tank ownership side, I would really work to try to um, change that percentage. You know, if you're in an area that that's common, well, then, you know, that's a little different, but for the most part, you know, we like to see you try to get that tank ownership up. So then just margin and profitability trends. Uh, so generally what we look at and what buyers look at when they're, you know, looking at these these metrics is they're, they're reviewing your financials year over year and looking for any fluctuations or any trends. So, you know, on the margin side, our our gross margins, are they trending upward? Are they trending downward? Are they fluctuating year to year? And, you know, if they're fluctuating year to year or, you know, going up or down, you know, always the, there's always the question of, you know, what's driving that? Is there, you know, competi new competition that's coming to the area driving margins down or, um, you know, are margins increasing dramatically the last couple of years because maybe the buyers or maybe the sellers trying to get as much cash out of the business before they sell, um, you know. So, 
you know, understanding what's driving those margins um, and, you know, what's going on is, is key. Uh, the big question, you know, buyers always have, especially when you see increasing margins is, you know, is that sustainable? Are those margins sustainable for the foreseeable future? Um, or, you know, year one, when the buyer takes over, are they gonna have to drop margins back down to, you know, prior, you know, lower than what they were in the prior years? So, um, again, you know, getting as much margin is important, but uh, sustainability is probably, you know, just as important or maybe more important than higher margins. So the next topic that we want to talk about was safety. And again, 25% of the respondents thought that safety should be in the top five. And what I really want to focus on with safety is Developing procedures and training and documentation, those things are so absolutely critical. And these are things like your gas checks, your leak tests. If you have underground tanks, you know, what cathodic protection procedure and training are you doing and documentation? And it becomes really important because buyers, and if you're a buyer, you should be definitely be looking at this because you want to know that day one, when you close that business, that you're not going to have an accident or the probability of having an accident is extremely low because of the safety procedures and documentation that the company that is being sold has implemented. And we're talking about procedures that make sure that all of your staff know, you know, these are the procedures that we go through. They've had the training, they understand, you know, these are the forms we use. This is how you fill out the form. So everybody's doing the same form. You should be able to pick up forms from each one of the individuals that are doing your, your safety checks and leak checks and look at them and they should be filled out exactly the same. And they should be signed by the customer as well. Documentation is so critical. A uh, quick story about documentation. There's a company um, in the Midwest a number of years ago and uh, there was an accident. But there was a family on Easter Sunday, and just to kind of set the stage, it was a family on Easter Sunday, and they had, you know, a whole bunch of family members over and everything. The kids were down in the basement, and they were playing, and they came up, and they got some air freshener, and they said, oh, the, the basement smells. Well, you know, the parents thought, oh, musty old basement, you know, didn't think anything about it. Luckily, it was a really nice day. Everybody wound up going outside, um, but there was an accident. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured, um, but it turned out when the fire marshal went to investigate the accident, it turned out that it definitely was a propane leak that caused the accident. So he went to the propane company that had actually serviced that tank and asked to see the customer's file. Went through the file and found the gas check that was performed on that particular um, installation. And what he found on that gas check was the company had gone through, they had listed every single appliance on the gas check, the serial number, the, the fuel source of that particular appliance, the date that it was done, and that it was signed by the customer. Well, when the fire marshal compared that documentation to all the appliances that were in the house, what he found was on the gas check, there was a propane water heater um, on the gas check. But when he actually went to the house, he found an electric water heater. So at some point in time, the homeowner had switched out that electric water heater for, or the gas water heater for an electric water heater. And what they had done, they didn't call a gas company, they didn't call them and, and ask them to come, you know, take it away, cap the, the line properly and everything. What they had done is they had put duct tape on that line, that feed line coming in. Well, I'm sure you guys are all sitting there rolling your eyes knowing how long duct tape is actually gonna work in that situation. Well, there was a leak, there was an accident. But because this retailer had taken the time and done the proper you know, documentation, he was not found liable in this and he didn't have to pay out any claims because of it. So documentation can save you. And if I'm a buyer, I wanna see that kind of documentation. If you're a buyer, you should also wanna see that kind of documentation if you're looking to make an acquisition. So those things are, are very, very important. Um, if you've got DOT tanks, you know, you also wanna make sure that, you know, you're doing the proper testing every, you know, the number of years, every five, 12 years that you need to be doing those, those testings. 
Um, regulators is another perfect example. If you're if you've got a business that's 40 years old, but you've never changed out any regulators, that's going to be a flag for buyers that, you know what, they may feel like they need to have new regulators. And so that's going to be a cost for them. That's going to be something that they're going to look at, you know, when they're looking at the value of your business. So all those kinds of programs are important to be sure and put in place. The next one we're going to talk about is quality of staff. And again, 25% of the, the respondents to our survey said quality of staff, you know, they thought should be in the top five. And really, people are a key differentiator in your business. You know, they're the front line that talks to the customer. They're the ones that make sure it's, you know, everything done. And, you know, good people are going to lead to good efficiencies and profitability. Um, you know, strong staff typically want technology, which also helps with those efficiencies. And, you know, if you've got staff who doesn't want to embrace that technology, you know, then you, you need to, you know, stop and think about, do you have the right staff in place kind of thing. Um, the other thing is, if a staff member were to leave, have you taken all that information and put it into some kind of a system or is it in their head? Because the last thing you want is for all of your tank, you know, tanks and where they're sitting to be in somebody's head someone's head, whether it's you, the owner, or the driver, or something like that, because you want anybody to be able to come in and pick up and start making deliveries to that location. In fact, as we were just recently um, on, a, on a closing where we had to, you know, go around and, and identify where those tanks were because they were all in the seller's head. He hadn't put them in a system, and so it took a lot of extra time and effort just to make sure that when that buyer took over the business, he would know where to find those tanks. So, it's important to have that information um, put there, you know, put somewhere that is easily accessible. The other thing is, can you retain the staff? You know, that's something, or do you want to retain the staff? I think maybe is even a better question if you're looking to make an acquisition. Um, one of the things I would suggest if you're thinking about, you know, selling is how much of the day-to-day -day responsibilities lie with you, the owner? And can you start shifting some of those to a new, a new individual, you know, another individual. One of the things we see is that a lot of times uh, an owner may own a particular uh, license or, or hold a license or something that's critical to your business and it's not transferable. If you're thinking about selling, I would highly encourage you to start getting another employee lined up, you know, to take those tests and stuff. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So staff are absolutely critical for your business. Uh, the next one that we're going to talk about is gallons trends. Again, 24% believe that gallons trends should be in the top top five. And why are they so, so important? Is there an indicator of showing growth of your customers, growth and, or loss of your customers? And you know they can drive. They're going to drive your earnings. And it's not just the trends and what's happening with those gallons that's important, but the trends with you know is it residential gallons that's growing or shrinking? Is it the commercial gallons that's increasing, shrinking, or ag gallons? And what are those gross margins that are associated with those gallons? So don't just look at the gallons, but look at the each individual gross margin as well, like Cooper talked about. And then weather adjust those gallons accordingly as well. Uh, did some work with a company um, out west a number of years ago, and that particular company, uh, as part of you know doing the work for them, I had asked for their net tank loss gains and losses, and they were able to get me for the last three years by month by route all the tanks they sat and the tanks they picked up. And as doing the work with them because we were doing evaluation, you know, I, I was looking at this, and the reason that we like to see it is it's kind of an indicator of what's going to happen in the future. Um, on how many, you know, customers are gaining or lossing. It's going to kind of give you a picture as to where those trends are going. And for the most part, this company looked, you know, average, you know, just like everyone else, you know, nice, normal growth, but nothing, you know, exceptional. And I got to one particular route, and what I noticed was starting in September of that year that we were in, and we were finishing up in December was the end of the financial time frame when we were doing the valuation, is they had started losing customers, like 85 customers in September, like 125 in October, you know, 200 in November. Well, by the end of December, they lost over 500 customers. 
So I called the co company up and I said, you know, what's going on with this route? Why are you losing so many customers? And what they told me was natural gas had come in down that route and they had taken essentially all of their customers. Well, those losses had not shown up yet on the financial statements or the gallons reports. So had I not asked that question, if they were thinking about selling or if a buyer had not asked that question, then they may have overpaid significantly for that business because they didn't recognize that they weren't gonna be getting those gallons going forward. So it's a great measure for what's gonna be happening going forward. So looking at those you know, net tank sets and understanding you know, how do they play with your gallons is really important. All right, quality of assets. So what we're looking at here is, you know, your rolling stock, consumer tanks, bulk storage, land and building. Uh, on the on the rolling stock, why it's important is, you know, with newer or better quality assets, you know, obviously you're gonna have less repairs and less maintenance. But maybe one of the bigger items is, uh, your, you know, the less risk of lost opportunity cost. You know, you're less likely to have a bobtail go down and not be able to deliver those customers. Um, you know, that can be a you know real financial burden on, on a retailer if it happens in you know the middle of January or February. Um, for the consumer tanks, uh, you know, one of the big things we see here is you know when we go on due diligences and stuff with uh, buyers is you know the sell buyers and sellers is you know they're gonna they're gonna look at the consumer installation, you know, consumer tanks and the installations. So, you know, they're looking at it from one. A safety standpoint, you know, saying, you know, were they properly installed? But two, they're looking and say, you know, is this a good tank? And really what they're looking at is uh, that data plate on the tank. Um, you know, they want to make sure that it's there and one, you know, one, it's there, but also is it legible? Uh, you know, we were up in a uh, due diligence up in, I think it was the upper Midwest, uh, on our due diligence, you know, big company, uh, you know, they probably had over 10,000 customers. And, you know, we were going through, you know, the tanks and, you know, there's a trend on uh, the tanks were, the data plates were, you know, really hard to read. And what we found out was that retailers buying refurbished tanks from someone, um, but they were really low grade tanks. And well, the buyer, you know, had a you know pretty big issue with it because they were going to have to go through and replace all those tanks that were out in the field or virtually all those tanks out in the field that, um, you know, data plates you couldn't read. And that's, as you know, a, you know, real costly expense. You know, when, normally when we do valuations, you know, I'd say probably, Tam, what do you think? 65%, 75% of the asset values related to the consumer tanks probably. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, so, you know, that's, you know, those consumer tanks are, you know, real important to the, to the buyer. Um, and then, you know, going on, still on those consumer tanks, ASME versus DOT tanks. You know, if you're if you're running DOT tanks, you know, as you know, there's a cost to maintain those tanks. You have to do a visual every five years, or if you're not doing a visual, you have to do a hydro every, I think, 10 or 12 years. So, um, you know, if you can go with the ASME tanks, they may be a little more expensive on the front end, but you're not going to have that recurring maintenance. Um, you know, throughout the throughout the life of the company, uh, and then finally, you know, just land and buildings. You know, are, is the building falling over and it's going to need a lot of work put into it? And you know, does is the land clean or does uh, you know have oil on it and needs to be remediated? Uh, seems like land is always an issue. Uh, always comes up as an issue when we're selling companies. Uh, you know, whether it be uh, there's a lien on the land or some type of septic tank or there was refined fuels on the property at one point and you know they haven't gotten the proper clearance letters or remediation letters from uh, the specific state organization that you know requires that uh, so you know quality of assets plays a you know pretty key role in 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 that multiple all right so let's go on just the customer growth uh, kind of like Tamara said you know Review the tank gains and losses. You know, most buyers are going to be looking at that these days, uh, just for exactly what she said. You know, it's maybe a you know better indicator of what's going to happen in the future. It might not be showing up on that uh, P and L statement or you know that P and L statement for the prior year. 
um, because you know customer growth or you know even customer loss does affect future cash flows. So um, it can also be just you know a telltale sign of where the company is on a competitive standpoint. Whether it's you know the company is growing dramatically, maybe their you know margins are undercutting the competition, or you know maybe they're not growing at all, and it's you know their margins are you know where the market is. So it can be a telltale sign of you know where they are competitively. There's a company up in Ohio that we we represented, or I guess it wasn't Ohio, it was somewhere somewhere on the East Coast. Um, you know they uh, they were growing like crazy. They had tons of growth and um, you know always looking you know looking forward you know and kept wanting the buyers to pay for this future growth. Um, and buyers, you know, there's many buyers just won't pay for that future growth because they don't know what it's going to be. So prior to selling, you know, you really need to time when uh, when you see that growth, when you realize that growth, and maybe, you know, maybe towards the last couple of years, you don't grow four or five, 600 customers, but, you know, maybe a couple hundred customers instead, uh, just because the likelihood of a buyer or multiple buyers at least paying for that growth, uh, you know, is slim, slim to none. So, uh, so let's go in, we're going to go into, you know, what the value of a customer is. And, Really, it's going to depend on the type of the customer and how you run your business. Uh, so we're just going to kind of go. This is kind of just a forecast on what the cash flows of a customer would look like, uh, you know, based on like a ten-year forecast. And what we did is we used a. Uh, we just said that you know a customer, this customer, particular customer, uses 450 gallons a year, dollar uh, twenty-five margins with. You know, we're saying the operating expenses is about 85 cents a gallon, giving you a net margin of 40 cents. Uh, this is a company-owned tank, so they're going to be getting tank rent, and you know they're going to have that capital expenditure uh, purchase in the tank. So, you know, year one, you're going to have negative cash flow, but then you can see year two through 10, you're looking at about a $245, uh, you know, cash flow amount coming in. You know, when you discount that at a 7% rate. Uh, you know, you're looking at a customer value about $600, and we've got this Excel sheet. So if you guys are looking to, you know, get this, you can email Tamara or myself, and we can get this over to you. You can kind of plug your own figures in on, you know, what your operating expenses are on a, you know, cents per gallon basis, margins are, you know, size customer, all that good stuff, um, and then also what your cost of capital is to properly discount it. But you know that's kind of how you want to look at it is say you know what what are my future cash flows on this customer going to be uh based on you know what their gallons are margins operating expenses etc so just like cooper mentioned you know what's you know what's the cut value of one customer to you the other thing i want you guys to think about is what's the value of a burner tip what's that impact to you and one of the things i want you guys to think about when you think about your customers is for propane company customers, whether they're a residential customer, a commercial customer, an ag customer, propane is a line item on their expense budget. So, you know, it's it's just one thing in their expenses. You know, they've got a lot of other things, but if they don't have propane, then all of a sudden, you know, that can impact, you know, if their plant goes down or if they don't have hot water, those kinds of things. So it's really, you know, from a buyer's perspective, it's just a line item on their budget. But so what I want you to think about is, and we're really going to or focus on residential customers here, is what I want you to think about is that customer is going to be writing a check to someone. And the question is, who are they going to be writing that check to? Because they're going to want to heat their, you know, or heat their water, you know, have a warm home, cook their food, dry their clothes, those kinds of things. So wouldn't you rather them writing that check to you instead of the electric company? So the question is, what if, you know, what kind of value do additional burner tips mean to you? Because if you're already going to that home, it's just going to, to me, increase that number. So we're going to look at what just adding some water heater and propane dryer um, burner tips can mean to you. 
So let's take an example here. So we've got an example of a company um, that has 2,000 customers and 80% of those customers are home heat only. So that means there's a potential of 1,600 customers that they could put burner tips in for water heaters or dryers. Um, part of the assumptions, we're gonna stick with that $1.25 gross margin that Cooper had just talked about. And we're gonna say we wanna add 2% burner tips every year. And we're estimating that water heaters use 200 gallons a year and dryers use 150 gallons a year. Well, based on those assumptions, um, what we're gonna show in the next slide here is that, and let's look at 10 years. So in 10 years, if you were able to add 2% to your existing customer base and not grow anything else, you would have, um, you would have added 320 burner tips for water heaters and 320 burner tips for dryers for a total combined increase gallons of 112,000 gallons and total increase margin of $140,000. The thing is, you're already going to those locations. So unless you increase the tank because of the additional gas, is very minor compared to this additional gross margin that you're going to be gaining at that existing location. So over that 10 years, if you were to add that total gross margin cumulatively that you've been able to get over 10 years, you'll have earned $770,000. Now let's think about that. So if you were to actually put a six multiple on this increase in value, you would increase your value by $840,000. Add those two together over a 10 year time frame. if you were to sell that business at the end of 10 years and you will have earned an additional $1.6 million by adding those 320 burner tips to your business for water heaters and, and uh, dryers. So that's really the value of additional burner tips. And the key is, do you, you know, the customers are gonna be paying that to someone. And you know, we know propane's efficient so explain how it's more, you know, their propane is more efficient than electricity, how it's actually going to save them money in the long run. And it's going to help make you money because, like I said, they're going to be writing a check to somebody. Shouldn't they be, they be writing it to you instead of an electric company? So, like I said, as you're trying to gain customers, also try to gain those burner tips as well. All right, market segment. As as Tamara mentioned earlier, you know, market segment was, you know, kind of ranked a little bit lower than what we probably would have ranked it. Um, you know, from our, you know, from your peers, uh, we probably would have ranked it a little bit higher just because we see that residential uh, businesses bring a higher multiple. And uh, kind of a couple of reasons for that is, you know, you build a large customer base, which means, you know, you don't have you know, a couple accounts that, you know, really carry the weight, which is, you know, less risky for a buyer coming in uh, because they're going to look at it and say, you know, hey, we have, you know, 3,000 accounts. If we lose one or two or 100, it's not going to make a huge impact to the bottom line. Whereas, you know, if you have uh, larger maybe ag or commercial accounts and you lose 100, well, it's going to have a significant impact to the bottom line. Uh, residential accounts also generally have, you know, higher margins. They're less price conscious. You know, ag, ag customers or commercial customers, or, you know, it's a, it's a line. You know, propane is a line item on their P&L statement, and, you know, if they can save a couple cents a gallon, you know, they're more likely to switch. So, uh, focus on profitable gallons, not just or profit, yeah, profitable gallons, not just gallons. Uh, there was a retailer down in the southeast that uh, sold a number of years ago. Uh, they, it was primarily an agricultural business. They did a lot of chicken farms and you know, farming, ag, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, re, you know, someone bought them. And a new retailer came into the market and cut the price five cents. Well, you know, with them, you know, being, you know, very price focused, most of the customers switched over to this new retailer into the market. And, you know, the buyer lost all their business, uh, you know, and, you know, they, Probably didn't do very well on their investment on that one, um, but you know that's kind of just to show you know the ag business uh, is a lot more risky, or commercial business is a lot riskier than you know the residential business. Uh, and then we're going to top accounts here. So top accounts kind of goes in line with the, that market segment. You know, 
large accounts are great, but you know, if you lose a couple, what's going to do to your bottom line? Uh, you know, it kind of goes back to don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, I'm not saying don't go after those top accounts or, you know, large accounts, go for them. But if you can, you know, try to get them on contracts where they're on a, you know, five-year agreement or, you know, if they don't want to do a five-year, try to do like a one-year evergreen agreement where, you know, renews year over year. Uh, that that tends to put, you know, a little bit less risk on the buyer if you do have those contracts in place. Now, if you're going to, you know, you have a five-year contract in place and, you know, you're in year four and you want to sell your business, well, you know, that contract might not be as, you know, worthwhile as it was, you know, year one of the contract. But, um, you know, try to get contracts on those top accounts. It, it definitely helps uh, lower the risk for for a buyer. All right, then operational efficiency. So, uh, you know, what we like to do when we're looking, when do doing valuations or putting a sales package together, we'll always show on the P&L statement what the business looks like on a cents per gallon basis. And it's really the only way to compare, you know, one retailer from another. You can see, you know, on a cents per gallon basis, you know, what the operating expenses are, what the margins are, and, you know, compare it, you know, relative to other people within you know, those areas or, you know, different regions. Um, obviously, the goal with the business as a distribution company is to, you know, maximize the amount of gallons you can deliver before another employer or truck is needed. So, kind of go into this, you know, visual here is, you know, A, you know, points A, C, and E, those are your most, you know, profitable gallons. You know, at the point you have to go from A to B, or you know C to D because you add a customer, you know you're gonna have to add that employer bobtail. You know B and D, those are your least profitable gallons because you're not you know running in a full steam. You're having you know employees deliver less, um, and you have that extra bobtail which you know you need, but you could add you know 250,000 more gallons before you get back to E here. So um, when you're when you're getting ready to sell, you really want to be on, you know, in a position where you're, you know, you're maxing out the amount of gallons you can deliver and not adding that additional body or box. So you really want to be at, you know, B, C, or E uh, standpoint. And lastly, you know, density. As you guys know, you know, the more dense you are, the more you can, you know, drop a delivery and then go to the neighbor right next door and make another delivery. Uh, efficiencies, you know, definitely increase dramatically once you start getting, getting that density. So let's talk a little bit about positioning to sell. And I think the most important thing we can say is that it doesn't matter. Um, uh, well, let me rephrase that. The most important thing is don't wait until the day before you get ready to sell to start positioning it to sell. What we would suggest you do is start positioning it to sell today or to transfer it to family members or, you know, down the line. Start working on that today because you don't know, you know, what you're, what's going to happen. Um, if you start today, you know, it doesn't matter if you want to sell in 20 years, you know, Something could happen that could all, all of a sudden bring that day that you need to sell much closer to than what you had anticipated. Uh, perfect example is we were working with a retailer and they thought they wanted to sell their business. And we did a valuation for them. And it's somebody that we had worked with off and on over the years. And we did a valuation for them and they said, hmm, if that's what I'm going to get for my business, you know what? I think I'm going to go ahead and keep running it and I'm going to take these these areas that you know you've indicated that we're weak on and we're really going to focus on those and try to improve those and strengthen our business we're going to get it to be you know get a higher earnings but we're also going to try to work to get that higher multiple by you know working on some of these items that you know we've just talked about today and so they took five years and they were working on those items and they actually really changed the complexion of their business both from an earning standpoint as well as from how they had handled all of those items that impact the multiple and they had planned on continuing to run the business for another several years but there was an, um, an unfortunate event that occurred and so the seller had to you know 
move his timeline up because something in life happened then all of a sudden he said i need to sell today but because they'd been positioning themselves to sell they were able to do that ahead of time um, or when when that that time came so the thing that i would say is don't wait um, be sure and do it now so the other thing to think about is if you're a c corporation um, and you want to change to an S corporation, it's a five-year window that you have to wait from converting from a C to an S before you could take advantage of that S corp taxation. So it's another one of those things that you need to start planning on. And the other thing that, that you want to do is you don't want to limit your buyers. And just like Cooper mentioned land, land always seems to be something that pops up that can be an issue. Well, one of the things with land because let's say that it's you own the property personally, but you don't want to sell the land, but there's nothing in the area where somebody could move it. You know, that's something that you need to start thinking about before you sell that business, because you don't want to limit a buyer who doesn't have something in the area, you know, so that they can't come in and, and make a good offer on your business because that's going to be a burden to them. So there's a lot of different things that you need to be taking a look at now ahead of time so that you don't limit your buyers going forward. So when you're positioning to sell, there's really um, several areas that you need to be focused on. And we're going to talk about each one of these in, in particular. Um, but we're going to be reviewing gallons and financials. You're going to be working to increase the bottom line and reviewing your records. And we're going to be talking about each one of these here in more detail. Yeah, so just to start with the uh, reviewing financials and gallons, um, you know, buyers like to see at least three years back of financials. So, you know, they're going to compare those year to year and kind of going back to those margin trends and profitability trends, they're going to say, you know, hey, what are the margins doing on, you know, year to year? Are they fluctuating, increasing, decreasing, you know, on the operating expenses, you know, what's going on with those? Um, and they're going to check them to make sure they match the tax returns. Uh, you know, that's a That's a big thing because uh, buyers are pretty confident that you're not going to go, uh, uh, you know, fraudulently file more income than what you uh, had and pay taxes on it. Um, on the financial statements, you know, buyers are you know looking for in inconsistencies. You know, why did blank happen? Why did why did uh, uh, the repair and maintenance line item jump fifty thousand dollars? You know, what's going on there? Um, and then, you know, when we're doing valuations, uh, you know, we're trying to identify, you know, income or expenses a buyer may not have going forward or they might have going forward, you know, because there there's some add backs you can put in there say, you know, hey, you know, the, you know, the seller went in and did $50,000 of uh, building improvements on their building and, you know, it was under repair and maintenance, but, you know, it's, not an expense that you're going to have going forward it was really a one-time expense uh, so really identifying those items can really help increase that uh, EBITDA number and you know get the maximum value that you're you know receiving for the business and lastly uh, we see a lot of companies will go through and they'll expense you know everything they can and I mean we understand why you're doing it's to you know help save on taxes for you know pay less taxes but you know if you anything you can capitalize really should be capitalized enough to a three five years out uh you know because it does get batted back with depreciation and EBITDA so you know making sure you, you know, capitalize versus expense those items uh again can help you know drive that value drive that value up um it was fine we were doing a doing a valuation business sale for a lady in the Midwest and we found that when we were doing it uh, her tank rent was like extremely high and we're like man she's just killing it with her tank rent well come to find out her accountant was double counting her tank rent and we would have never found it out you know without doing evaluation but you know she would ended up having getting to go back and amend you know three five years back on her tax returns because um, you know, she was paying double tax on all that tank rent. So, you know, getting having a third party look at the company just to see from an outsider standpoint, um, you know, what's what's going on can really, you know, help you guys out in the long run. So, um, you know, it's, it's important to have 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 someone else look at it. It's, it, it does help. 
So last or next year is increased bottom line. Uh, so, you know, some different ways to do that is, you know, introduce a fee, whether that be a delivery fee, statement fee, hazmat fee, um, you know, it can be $5. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. You know, most people probably won't even realize that you started doing it. You'll probably get two or three phone calls, but, you know, the other 2,000 customers won't, won't even know. If you're not charging tank rent, start charging tank rent on, you know, new customers going forward, maybe. Um, it kind of just, you know, helps keep a line on you know this is the company tank and not the customer tank even if it's i mean even for like if it's a dollar it at least uh you know makes the customer realize that they didn't buy that tank or just get that tank for free uh, margin enhancement so you know what what can you increase the margins five cents and we're gonna let's look real quick kind of see what that does to the business so you know, if you, let's just say you have a uh, 1.5 million gallon retailer, 2,000 customers, you know, they got gross margin of $1.25. Well, what's a five cent increase do to the business? And well, I guess let's start, what does it do to the customers? The customer, if it's a 750 gallon account, uh, you know, it's gonna increase that customer $37.50 a year, you know, $3.13 a month. So it's really, you know, really negligent impact to the customer. But when you start looking at a, on a company standpoint, you know, you're going to increase the gross margin by $75,000, ultimately increasing the bottom line $75,000. So if you were to put like a five to eight multiple on that, you're looking at, you know, $375,000 to $600,000 increase in value just by adding five cents. Now, again, it goes back to, is that sustainable? You know, buyers want to see that five cents year over year. So, you know, can you produce it two, three years in a row without having a customer attrition? That's, you know, that's the key there. But it does, you know, provide a significant value to the customer or to you, to the retailer. Uh, make sure you're properly staffed. That goes back to that stair step approach. You know, make sure that you're running on, you know, full efficiencies. Uh, you know, if you need to add gallons, add gallons. If you need to uh, reduce the staff, CSR, whatever it is, you know, it might be worth doing. And then finally, you know, fire 1% of your customers. Get rid of those trouble accounts that, you know, call you all the time. They, you know, cause what is 80% of the headaches. Um, you know, fire those customers, whether they're slow pay or they um, always running out of gas, you know, always giving you a hard time, you know, just uh, tell them that, you know, someone else down the street can service them. So. so another thing that, that we definitely encourage you to do is review your records. Um, look at your customer files. And if this is if you're preparing to sell or if you're looking to make an acquisition, these are things that you definitely need to be looking at. You know, look at your customer files. Do they have the gas checks in them? Do they have the, you know, signed tank lease agreements in them? You know, if you have budget payment or pre-buys, you know, are those in their customer files? I can't tell you how many times we get to, you know, due diligence or closing and find out that they're missing some very critical documentation. And this is something that we just can't stress enough, especially on those gas checks and tank leases. Um, you really need to have those because the last thing you want to do is like a customer that we were working with um, up in the upper Midwest in November, late November when it was very cold, they told us all along that they had their tank leases on file. And we said, you know, we're coming up to do due diligence with the buyer, you know, need to be sure and have those available. And their response was, well, about those tank leases. And Cooper said, yeah. She said, well, they're in short supply. Like, what do you mean by that? Well, essentially, they didn't have hardly any tank leases on file. So here we are at the end of November. It is really cold. And the seller decides, okay, I'm going to, you know, we said we can help you get these out or and they, the seller says, no, I'm going to do it myself. Well, a lot of nights spent, you know, getting those, you know, letters sent out or those leases sent out to customers to try to get them signed and back in in a couple of weeks so that they could actually um, have closing because that was a condition of closing. And it's a lot of stress that that seller didn't need to have to go through had they worked and done the, the proper steps leading up to and preparing themselves to, to be ready to sell. Um, equipment in the field, make sure you know where your assets are. We've already talked about that, you know, make sure that they're in the system. 
you know, do you have any zero throughput tanks, any tanks that haven't had any gas that's gone through them the last 12 to 18 months? And you said, is there any, you know, why, why is that? They'll pick those tanks up. The last thing a buyer, or if you're the buyer, wants to do is go out there the day after closing and find out you've got 300 tanks sitting in the field that don't have any gas going through them, and you've got to go pick those tanks up. So um, know where your equipment is and, and make sure that what you've got in the field is actually being used by the customer. Um, update your system. Make sure information's in there. Uh, make sure your VKs and hydros are done on your, your trucks. Make sure that you know they're in good working order. Uh, the DOT files are in the trucks and they're up to date. Um, personnel records, make sure those are up to date. You know, we've uh, actually gone and, you know, to due diligence and found out that some of the employees actually didn't have the proper licensing um, to do the job properly. So they had to scramble around and get those proper licensing. And just like I mentioned earlier, if you hold a particular license that is it you that's licensed to you personally and not with the company and it's required for your business or if you're looking to buy a business and that's the case and you can't have anybody sit for that for six months that's one of those things that you can be doing ahead of time to prepare for that sale is getting somebody else you know trained up and, and getting that proper license because we know there are some states that have certain licenses that you can't do certain aspects of your business without that license and, and it can be a um, a factor that dictates closing when when that shouldn't be something that's dictating closing. Land records, make sure you've, you know, go through and, and make sure your surveys are up to date and that there's no, you know, liens on the land and that everything's, you know, in, in good working order because the organizations that you have to go and get those, you know, that, you know, that lien taken care of or that, you know, that survey or the abstract redrawn or something, they're not on your timeline. They're on their timeline. And that may not be lined up with yours in the buyer's or seller's timeline. Um, tax records. Make sure that you review, if you're a buyer especially, make sure that you review those tax records and make sure those taxes have been paid. Because there's a lot of states that even though there's successor liability laws in place, there's a lot of states where buyers can still become liable for those unpaid taxes. So it's something that we really want to caution you about and do a lien search, you know, make sure that, you know, you don't have any liens on your property or anything on the business. Cause a lot of times what happens is, you know, the buyer will always do a lien search or their attorneys will, and they'll find that there's a lien on the business. Well, it may be from a line of credit that you haven't used in five years, but it's still a lien on the business that you've got to get cleared up. So those are just some of the records reviews that we would, you know, really encourage you. If you're planning to sell, definitely do ahead of time. Or if you're looking to make an acquisition, you want to be sure and put on your to-do list to make sure that you get all of these things done when you're looking at an acquisition. So to recap, again, you know, these are the 10 items that, that we would certainly... Hey, Cooper, can you move up one? Cooper. Yeah, I'm trying. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Good job. So on the recap, you know, these are the 10 items that we've listed as drivers impacting the exit multiples. And, you know, there's something that I would encourage you to take a look at and kind of measure yourself um, where you are on them. So finally, the things that I would highly recommend you do is analyze your business. You know, what is your value today? Set a baseline. Where are you right now? If you were to have to sell today, what, you know, what could you get for your business? And would you be happy with it? If not, what do you need to do to increase that value? So start reviewing your business. I would suggest look at your business through somebody else's eyes. Um, look at your business as if you were going to be buying it. What would you be happy with? What would you not be happy with? And what would you want to change if you were going to be buying your own company? Um, so start doing that. Plan. Plan for the future, but plan as if you were going to have to sell tomorrow. So always be making that preparation, you know, whether it's passing it on to the family, selling it, you know, in five or ten years. But always, you know, know that what are the things that I'm doing, everything I'm doing today is increasing my value. So that if I had to move that timeline up, that it would be a value that I would be comfortable with. And then position, you know, work on positioning your business for sale. Start now because you never know when that life-changing event could happen. So 
whether it's transitioning it to a family member or or selling it, you know, constantly be working toward improving that value. So with that, does anyone have any questions that, that we could go over and answer for you? Okay, uh, Tamara, Cooper, thank you, well done. Um, we did have a couple questions come in. Um, they were a little bit earlier in the presentation, so I'm gonna ask you to jog your memory here for 40 minutes ago, but um, first sure. one, what factors can cause general market multiples to expand or contract? Are there regional differences in valuation multiples? Which regions are higher and which regions are lower? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll start and you can chime in. So what factors impact the multiples? It really, it's, I'm gonna tell you the 10 things that we talked about can all be factors that could impact that multiple. And I think the real question comes in is, is there something, because buyers buyers are gonna look at all of those factors and what they're gonna look at is, is there something that's gonna cause a major concern? And, and it's just, for example, a lot of times the top top accounts really have no bearing whatsoever. So you look at that very quickly and you discard it um, because it, you know they have you know the top 15% of their, or I'm sorry, the, you know, if you look at the top 15, 20 customers, you know, it's two or three percent of their total gallon. So they don't say, okay, that that's within our measure. We're going to discount that one. But in another case, they may be looking at it, and it could be 40 percent of the volume is with those top three or four accounts. Well, now all of a sudden that becomes big. So you really have to look at them all together, and and then you start seeing which ones are are the concerns. Um, I think if I had to rank them myself, I would say tank ownership. Um, what are the gross margins doing and how are they trending? What are the gallons doing? What kind of growth are we seeing to me? Unless there's something in one of those areas, like, you know, if all of a sudden you're seeing, you know, extreme tank losses, like we were in that one company that, that I talked about, you know, then all of a sudden that pops up and becomes a big issue because that's going to affect other, it's going to affect your gallons, your EBITDA going forward, those kinds of things. So I think you have to look at all of them with each each acquisition or each sale, but then you quickly pull the ones out that aren't important and really focus on the others. But to me, tank ownership, margins, um, the mix of your, your gallons, you know, residential, ag, commercial, those kinds of things are the ones you really look at first um, and what those trends are. Regions, um, typically your, your Northeast, um, Northwest, California, you know, that West Coast, your coasts are going to have higher margins. The, the Midwest is going to have lower margins, um, typically, uh, the way you, where you see it. The more densely populated areas typically have higher margins, more sparsely populated in some cases have lower margin. It just really depends. But usually the Midwest has the lower margins and the, the coasts have the higher margins. Cooper, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, and probably part of the reason that's driving the the coast is there's generally higher reg regulations on the coast, so um, you know it's a natural barrier to entry, which you know helps uh, you know keep other comp competition out of the market. So uh, yeah, and I would agree with kind of everything you you hit on there. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> You brought up an example of a, a client you were working with that had a natural gas line come in, how that impacted their, their customers. I'm going to read the question verbatim here. Regarding your, your example of the company losing customers to natural gas, is the seller obligated to disclose any factor that may have a material impact on the valuation, or is it a case of let the buyer be let the buyer beware? I don't you know. You have to disclose that in that scenario. I, yes. You want to go first, Cooper? Yeah, I would just say, yeah, I mean, if it's going to materially impact, you know, the business that, I mean, that would be something that, you know, you would have to, you should be disclosing to the buyer, um, especially if you're picking up, you know, 25% of your business, uh, um, you know, from natural gas. It's going to have a material impact to the the financials going forward so yeah that should be something that you know should be disclosed to to uh to a buyer yeah do you have to i would say no but i i would i would have i wouldn't be able to sleep at night without disclosing something of that material in in nature 
kind of thing. And I mean, when you get um, into the agreement, there's going to be reps and warrants that you have to, you know, rep and warrant. Right. And, you know, there's going to, there's no, one of them is there's been no material change in the business. So, you know, that would be a material change in the business. So, sure, you right. don't have to, but they might come back after you later. Yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing that I would just follow up on that example is the company wound up, they didn't sell their business, but they, sorry about that, uh, they wound up taking all those tanks that they had picked up, gone further out, and were able to set those tanks. So they actually put them back in service, but it took a couple of years to get that done. Um, so, which is which is a positive thing, but yeah, to answer your question, I agree with Cooper. There are reps and warrants, and if it's a material change, it should be disclosed. Thank you. That is all that came in here this morning. So um, with that being said, uh, we're going to wrap up. Tamara, Cooper, appreciate it. Uh, again, excellent presentation. Appreciate your expertise here this morning. Your information is on the screen. Okay, yeah, so if obviously anyone uh, would like to reach you, that is certainly the best way. Uh, we will be recording. This is recorded. We will be adding this presentation to the on-demand platform hopefully by tomorrow morning at the latest. So if some, as in the attendees on the on the webinar here, if someone from your team would like to see it or you want to share it with someone, you can do so uh, through the platform. So with that being said, we're going to wrap up. Any last, any last words here or comments on your end? Uh, I just want to thank everybody for attending and thank you for the questions. Those are great questions. And if you have any other questions that you want to reach out to us individually, you know, certainly give us a call or, or send us an email. We'd be happy to visit with you. Thank you. Thank you guys. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Be safe. Take care. Bye.